Hi, I'm Rochelle Gentile, president of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra League. I'm here at the Dubuque Golf and Country Club, kicking off our virtual soundbite series. Under normal circumstances, you'd be right here with me, enjoying a great lunch and a preview of the DSO's upcoming concert, and I'm sure you will be again soon. As you may know, the DSOL develops and administers projects, programs, and events that provide music education opportunities to folks of all ages as well as financial support to the DSO and its youth ensemble programs. Each year, the League contributes support to youth education events and programs such as the 3rd and 5th grade Arts Trek concerts, the 4th grade Adopt a Musician program, the Youth Concerto Competition, the Dubuque Symphony Youth Ensembles, and the Summer String Camp. Along with our many other endeavors is our Senior Classics program, now in its ninth year, providing performances by DSO musicians to entertain residents and their families at local nursing homes and assisted living centers. While the past year has looked a little different, we continue to focus our efforts on fundraising. We encourage and welcome you to join us in our 54th year of supporting the DSO. Please check out the DSO's website for more information about how you can get involved. We hope to see you soon, but before I go, I'd like to introduce our esteemed music director and conductor, Dr. William Intrilligator. Thank you, Rochelle. I'd like to talk to you about the Mozart Divertimento that's on our program for Classics One. This is an example of one of Mozart's early geniuses, I think. You know, he was famous as an incredible prodigy. And at the age of, well, 15 going on 16, he created this Divertimento as he had just returned to his hometown of Salzburg from a little tour of Italy with his father. He actually, I think, went on three tours of Italy, and this was a time between his second and third tour. Um, you know, when he would go on these tours, he would demonstrate his skill at the violin and his skill at the harpsichord or, you know, early keyboard instruments. And he would also demonstrate his skill as a composer. Sometimes there's a famous story that he heard um, a great motet by an Italian composer, and then the composer offered him this copy of the score, and Mozart said, oh, I don't need it, it's in my mind. And they said, no, that couldn't be. I think he was only like, I don't know, 12 at the time or something like that. And Mozart, they said, well, prove it. And so Mozart wrote out the entire thing. <laughs> Amazing. So Mozart wrote this divertimento when he returned to Salzburg um, at age, oh, about 16 in 1772. Um, but people don't know if it was for a specific occasion. There were three divertimentos written around that same exact time. And this was before Mozart was in, in the employment of the um, archbishop. Um, his stormy relationship with that archbishop is well documented, including even in the movie Amadeus. But this was before that. This was the young teenage Mozart, and he was confident in his abilities and trying to prove himself. There's something um, lighthearted because it is a divertimento. It's supposed to delight, and it's just sort of diverting music. It's sort of light and upbeat. But there's also something that shows his genius already. There shows some hallmarks of the later style, even the operatic style of the late Mozart music. When I say late, of course, he did not get to live long, <laughs> but I mean later in his life, um, like his, you know, great operas when he, that he wrote in his 30s. Um, so this divertimento is scored for just violin one, violin two, viola, and basso. It's unclear whether this was written to be played by just four instrumentalists or maybe a small symphony of strings. But what's probably certain was that, like his serenades or nocturnes, that this divertimento was probably intended for outdoor music and maybe even accompany an outdoor party. So given that context, it was probably, it wasn't unusual to have more than one instrumentalist on a part so that the sound would carry outside. So there was a little bit of debate among music scholars early on with these divertimentos. Um, are they, should they be played by string quartet or should they be played by string orchestra? You know, they're not really symphonies. They only have three movements, not the four movements that normal symphonies would have. And around that time, symphonies that Mozart and others were writing would have horns and oboes. So the fact that it's just for strings does really point to the idea that maybe it really is more like one of his serenades, like Eine kleine Nachtmusik. And like Eine kleine Nachtmusik, it works equally well, whether it's for four instruments or a string orchestra. We're going to present it with a, a small ensemble of about, I don't know, 10 or 12 players. 
and it's lovely, lovely music. Here's an example of the opening of the first movement. We've already had some little glimpses of some of the harmonic daring that is showing Mozart proving himself and kind of moving the whole kind of idea of this lighthearted music forward that maybe this is more than just background music. Beautiful. Here's an example from the second movement, which really sort of like is like an aria from one of his operas. Listen to this. Incredibly delicious dissonances right there. Oh. Yes, so many times these great composers will create harsh sounding dissonances that actually are really some of the essence of the beauty of the music. When those dissonances resolve, something happens, you know, it moves us. Just gorgeous. Again, like I mentioned for the Brandenburg Concerto and the uh, Bach air from this orchestral suite, I feel like this music will be so healing and comforting after what we've been through um, just these, these months. The third and final movement, and the whole piece is relatively short, the third and final movement goes by in a flash. It's a presto that's in rondo form. And you might've heard the term rondo before. It's actually one of the easiest musical kind of architectural forms to kind of grasp onto because it's basically one main tune that keeps alternating with different tunes um, and the main tune keeps coming back. So it's almost like A, B, A, C, A, D, things like that. That's kind of a typical rondo. Here's an example of this full of life and energy, last movement. Back to a return of the beginning. And the whole movement is already halfway over. It's a delightful piece, this divertimento. I'm so excited to perform it for you at the concerts. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you.